Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Dear students, I'm school leader Dr. Nasreen Ali, assistant professor pediatrics. And uh, today we'll be learning uh, how to approach a child with diarrhea. The lecture will comprise of following contents. We'll have an introduction to diarrhea first. And then we'll go to the classification of diarrhea based on the mechanism of diarrhea and the duration of uh, diarrhea. And then we'll take up acute diarrhea, persistent diarrhea, and chronic diarrhea, their definitions and their causes, and briefly go to uh, history taking examination, assessment of dehydration management, ORS, role of zinc, dysentery, and our main focus will be on prevention. Okay, so now students, you will imagine that you are in the OPD where a four year old uh, boy is brought by his mother for with the complaints of diarrhea. So what five questions you think you will ask the mother to gain more uh, information about diarrhea? I want you to write it down on a piece of paper and we'll discuss it as we go along the uh, presentation. Okay. I hope that is done. So diarrhea, diarrhea is basically the passage of liquid or watery stools at least three times in 24 hours period. This is the consistency rather than the number of stools that is important. And frequent passing of form stool is not diarrhea. A lot of mothers will come to you with their babies uh, who are on mother feet. They'll complain that the baby is passing frequent stools. The baby is otherwise well. And as soon as the baby is fed, he passes stool capacity. So this is not diarrhea, this is a normal phenomena. The question is that why are we here studying diarrhea? Diarrheal diseases are the second leading cause of death in children under five years old. It is both preventable and treatable. So we must know what to do about it. 1000 million episodes each year in children under five years of age and Globally, there, is, uh, there are nearly 1.7 billion cases of childhood diarrhea diseases every year. Diarrhea is a leading cause of malnutrition in children under five years of age. Uh, a significant proportion of diarrhea diseases can be prevented through safe drinking water and adequate sanitation and hygiene. And 8% of these cases happens in first two years of age. So now coming to the classification of diarrhea. First, we are going to classify diarrhea based on the mechanism of diarrhea. So in regarding the mechanism, it could be secretory, it could be osmotic, increased motility, decreased motility, decreased surface area, and mucosal invasion. In secretory diarrhea, uh, the, the defect is because of the decreased absorption and increased secretion. And a good example of that is cholera and enterotoxigenic E. coli. And patients uh, have diarrhea during fasting. And if you do a stool examination, there are no stool leukocytes. In osmotic diarrhea, number two, there is maldigestion and there transport of transport defect and ingestion of unabsorbable uh, substances. And the good example is lactase deficiency or glucose galactase malabsorption and laxative abuse as well and the diarrhea in osmotic uh, diarrhea the osmotic diarrhea stops with fasting and uh, there are no stool leukocytes and uh, increased breath hydrogen with carbohydrate malabsorption is also present there is in the third mechanism or the the, the diarrhea is due to increased motility the defect is because there is decreased transit time and a good example is irritable bowel syndrome and uh, in fourth there is decreased motility which could be a defect in, in neuromuscular unit and it is uh, basically seen in pseudo obstruction and blind loop in blind the, the blind loop syndrome occur, occurs in uh, um, after abdominal surgeries where there is resection of small most of the small intestine or large intestine and there is a lack of nutrient absorption and overgrowth and because of the stasis there is bacterial overgrowth in such conditions there is decreased motility and diarrhea so uh, coming to number fifth 
there is there is decreased surface area, and uh, because of the decreased functional capacity, because of in again short bowel syndrome, celiac and rotavirus enteritis are good examples of decreased surface area. In short bowel syndrome, also that happens in post abdominal uh, surgeries where most of the most of the intestine is resected, and there is lack uh, less surface area. And lack of nutrient absorption in celiac disease, there is uh, villus atrophy. So there is the nutrition, uh, there is lack of nutrition absorption. And uh, in the last one, uh, the, there is mucosal invasion. And as the name says, this is because of the inflammation. Uh, and the good examples are infection due to Salmonella shigella. And if you do a stool RE, a stool examination the blood mucus and wbcs are seen now coming to the classification of diarrhea according to the duration so we have a di diarrhea uh, acute diarrhea we have persistent diarrhea per persistent severe persistent diarrhea where there is dehydration and chronic diarrhea acute diarrhea is basically recent onset diarrhea in persistent diarrhea, the diarrhea which has with or without blood, which begins acutely but and lasts for 14 days or longer. Persistent diarrhea when accompanied by some or severe dehydration is called severe persistent diarrhea. And chronic diarrhea is normally has a non-infectious cause and it lasts for more than 14 days. Acute diarrhea. Acute diarrhea is a recent onset diarrhea and it is the most common causes are infection. There are basically three types of indirect infection or three types of mechanism by which infection uh, are caused. Uh, in type 1 and uh, type 1 of infection, the, uh, the mechanism is through it is non-inflammatory. It is mediated through enterotoxins and there is superficial invasion. The site is proximal small bowel and the diarrhea is watery and there are no fecal leakage sites. Vibrio cholera, enterotoxigenic E. coli, uh, Staph aureus, Bacillus cereus are the bacteria that can cause it. V rotavirus and uh, Giardia are the good example of protozoal infections that can cause. Uh, in type 2 in, uh, in, enteric infection, they are med med mediated through cytotoxin and there is invasion. The bowel uh, uh, the part of the ball that is involved is colon and uh, it is the, the type is dysentery. There is blood also. Uh, blood is also present in uh, diarrhea. Uh, the examples are Shigella, uh, E. coli, Salmonella, uh, Vibria parahemolyticus and Clostridium difficile. In type uh, 3 uh, enteric infection, the mechanism is through penetration and the uh, uh, part uh, of the ball that is involved is the distal small ball and uh, it is caused by Salmonella typhi, Yersinia and Campylobacter. So here is a list of organisms that can cause diarrhea, uh, viral, bacterial and protozoal. The common viral infections, uh, the most common one is rotavirus, norovirus, other uh, adenoviruses and uh, as far as bacteria are confirmed there's a long list these are just uh, a few to name uh, vibrio cholera being on the uh, being the most uh, dangerous one and in the protozoal category entamoeba and giardia are uh, most common rotavirus is the leading cause of diarrhea in young children it, it uh, 5 to 25 percent of diarrhea disease in children, mostly young children, uh, mostly 6 to 24 uh, months of age, and it is spread through fecal oral route. And luckily, we have vaccination available, and it is now part of the EPI that is ex expanded program for immunization sponsored by the government. There are two doses, and the last, the second dose has to be before given before 13 weeks of. Uh, birth. Protozoals can also cause diarrhea, gyria and ent amoeba histolytica being the most common. Gyria uh, can cause diarrhea in 
uh, one to five years of age and it is ingested uh, it is uh, it is caused by ingestion of cis root fecal oral root and their existation occurs in the body and the trophozoites are released and gyria is also can cause chronic diarrhea and as a common cause of malnutrition as well if left untreated the other one is ant amoeba histolytica uh, it in uh, the it invades the large intestine and as, as can also cause uh, chronic diarrhea the diagnosis is based on seeing the uh, trophozoites in the stool sample bacterial causes of acute diarrhea although there are a number of uh, a number of uh, bacteria that can cause diarrhea e coli causes one quarter of all diarrheas in developing countries uh, because of lack of uh, sanitation and there are five groups enterotoxigenic enteropathogenic enteroadherent enteroinvasive and enterohemorrhagic and all of these types have different slightly different mechanism of uh, mechanism of uh, uh, causing pathogenesis some other pathogens that can cause uh, acute diarrhea are shigella campylobacter jejuni and vibrio cholera shigella 10 to 15 percent of acute diarrhea in under five and uh, campylobacter jejuni 5 to 15 percent of diarrhea again vibrio cholera can cause epidemics and produces large volume stools which are frothy and can cause uh, severe dehydration quickly and uh, are, uh, are un and, and fatal if untreated uh, uh, immediately the second type of diarrhea according to the duration was persistent diarrhea uh, which starts as acute diarrhea but persists for around 14 days uh, when persistent diarrhea is accompanied by uh, dehydration it is called uh, severe persistent diarrhea and uh, there are a number of etiologies we'll be discussing it later so now we have a another case scenario in this case scenario you're again in the opd and a four-year-old girl is brought by her mother in the opd and she says that this girl has diarrhea for the last uh three and a half years when she was when she started uh, most notably when she she was introduced weaning diet on examination she uh, the both the height and weight are below uh, third centile that means she she's grossly uh, malnourished and underweight and uh, her weight is all under height and underweight uh, she has uh, anemia and she has angular cellulitis and uh, which, which is showing signs of micronutrient deficiency as well so in this particular case you'll be thinking of chronic diarrhea with malabsorption and as the mother has said kid that the notably uh, diarrhea started after weaning so uh, pointing towards celiac disease so which will be uh, discussed in uh, detail later the third type of diarrhea according to the, according to the duration is chronic diarrhea there's a long list of etiology of chronic diarrhea we'll be just naming a few and just remember a few uh, common ones uh, primary lactose intolerance which could be congenital sec secondary lactase deficiency which is usually after an episode of acute gastroenteritis and uh, the, the and due to the damage of villi the lactase enzyme is lost and that causing secondary lactase deficiency then we have fat malabsorption which could be due to a number of syndromes and a number of diseases uh, cystic fibrosis being the most uh, prominent one showman syndrome and a beta lipoproteinemia and uh, then we have a group of diseases called inflammatory bowel diseases and uh, uh, comprising of crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis other causes of chronic diarrhea could be due to intestinal infections, Salmonella shigella and amoeba. Uh, surgical causes, I have already told you about short gut syndrome, blind loop syndrome, that is after abdominal surgeries, after uh, some intestinal uh, surgeries due to 
uh, intestinal atresias, Hirschsprung disease, and necrotizing enterocolitis. There are again uh, some uh, congenital defects causing uh, uh, causing abdominal um, pathologies, leading to abdominal surgeries. And then following the surgery, we have some uh, these short gut syndrome and blight loop syndromes. Some tumors, inclu including carcinoid and lymphomas, can also cause chronic diarrhea. Celiac disease. Celiac disease is due to gluten insensitivity, and uh, it causes uh, villi, uh, villi atrophy, and there is micronutrient uh, 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 deficiency due to lack of absorption, causing malnutrition, the decreased height and decreased weight, um, um, and short stature, and other signs of macronutrient deficiencies, as we discussed in this case, in the previous case scenario. Then we have a lot of immune deficiencies, which can cause chronic diarrhea, as and the, uh, a few are listed. So we have discussed the uh, classification of diarrhea, the etiology, and the mechanisms. With that, keep uh, that in mind. We we now proceed towards the uh, assessment of patient with a diarrhea, with diarrhea. Uh, now we know we have to ask such questions so that we can classify diarrhea, we can come to the etiology and we can roughly uh, make a picture how to manage the child. So our basic goal would be to get more information so that we can uh, plan a treatment for such a child. So and taking out your uh, for the, the, the chits that I told you to write down the brief questions that you're going to ask. So you can tell it. Uh, we are going to ask about the duration of diarrhea, the consistency of stools, the, uh, the number of stools that the, the child has been having. Is there any blood in stool? Is there, are there any associated uh, symptoms like fever, convulsions, cough or recent measles? Or what were the pre-illness feeding history uh, practices? And what are the type and quality of fluids, breastfeeds, and food consumed during the illness, and drug and other remedies taken. A careful history is, uh, is essential in the management of child, unless you can figure out uh, how much the diarrhea is and what were the feeding practices, practices were, and what were the, uh, 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 rough, roughly the cause, uh, cause is, you can you will be uh, not be able to treat the child uh, fully so the diarrhea of uh, the frequency of stools we have discussed the number of days blood and stools uh, any outbreak of cholera and the recent and the use of antibiotics is also very important in history taking after history we're coming to the examination uh, of a child with diarrhea the most important things are is to look for signs of dehydration and then we'll discuss how to classify uh, the dehydration as well. Uh, the, is the child restless or irritable? Is he lethargic? There's reduced level of consciousness. Are the eyes sunken? The skin pinch goes slowly or very slowly. And how is the child uh, drinking? Or is he able to drink or not? Uh, is there any, if the stool sample is there, is there any blood? or we are going to check also for the signs of uh, malnutrition and is there any abdominal mass present or any abdominal distension. So, uh, inside the signs of dehydration, look, you are going to look for lethargy, unconsciousness, sunken eyes, skin pinch going back very slowly and not able to drink, uh, uh, show that the child is severely dehydrated. This picture is showing how the skin is pinned through a child's abdomen to test for decreased uh, skin turgor. It goes back very slowly. It shows severe dehydration. It just goes back slowly. It uh, shows uh, moderate dehydration. In diarrhea, the killer is basically the dehydration. So the assessment of dehydration is of prime importance. And that will also help you in managing a... Uh, a plan for the child so 
we divided into three categories, low dehydration, some dehydration, and severe dehydration, according to WHO. Words for severe dehydration, we have plan C. For some dehydration, we have plan B. And then for low dehydration, we have plan A for treatment. The signs that you're going to look for as soon as starting from examination and then and then inspection. Uh, the, the child will, the state would be well alert and, and in uh, and a child with no dehydration. The tears would be present, eyes will be normal, oral cavity would be moist and the baby would be thirsty and with the will be drinking normally and in uh, when you pinch the skin the, it will go back quickly so there's no dehydration in moderate dehydration the child is restless the tears are absent the eyes are sunken the oral cavity is dry and uh, the skin pinch goes back slowly there's some dehydration and in severe dehydration the baby is lethargic and uh, the, the tears are absent the, the oral cavity is completely dry and the skin pinch goes back very slowly. Some other uh, points in examination that will help you dif differentiate between mild, moderate and severe dehydration are uh, the heart rate. The heart rate would be normal in case of no high dehydration or minimal dehydration while the heart rate would be in normal to increased in moderate and there will be tachycardia or in severe, very severe cases, there will be even bradycardia. The quality of pulses is normal in normal, uh, no dehydration <clears throat> patient, and in uh, it would be the pulses are normal to decreased in moderate uh, dehydration, and they're very weak and thready, and sometimes impalpable in severe dehydration. The breathing is normal in no dehydration in a child with no dehydration. It is normal or fast in moderate dehydration and there is deep sign breathing uh, in severe dehydration. The capillary refill uh, is normal in, uh, in a child with no dehydration. It is prolonged in moderate and very long and minimal in severe dehydration. Extremities are warm in no dehydration, uh, cool in moderate dehydration and cold mottled in severe cases, even cyanotic in severe dehydration. Urine output is, you must ask this question in the, the history, as well as when the examination, uh, you can uh, you can see, and then later when the child is admitted, you can ask for a complete record of, to monitor urine output. So it would be normal to decrease in minimal to no dehydration, decreased in mild to moderate, and very minimal in severe dehydration. So here are some points. So apart from complete inspection, so starting from the inspection, uh, palpation, and further taking the vitals. So this will help you in classifying the child into mild, moderate, and severe. And then you can label the severe sick patient and treat the patient and start immediately uh, the management. After taking a complete detailed history, and doing a proper examination, you'll make a differential diagnosis of a child with diarrhea uh, based on that. So if the, 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 uh, in the history, there are stools which are three, uh, more than three per day and there are no, bloody, no blood in stools and there's a recent history that you will label it as acute watery diarrhea. Uh, then if there are, there's a uh, history of outbreak in the in that particular area and the stools are large foul smelly and the child has had severe dehydration then you will think of cholera if there's blood in stools you'll think of dysentery and if there's the diarrhea has, has been there for last 14 days you'll think uh, label it as persistent diarrhea and diarrhea with severe malnutrition when there are you see signs of malnutrition <clears throat> in examination and uh, diarrhea associated with recent antibiotic use when there has been a history of prolonged use of oral antibiotics. And you will think of intersusception uh, when there you see a, a blood in stools, abdominal mass, and attacks of uh, crying with pallor in infant. Inter intersusception is a, a, a surgical emergency, and there is an intersusception which occurs normally in infants, normally around six to nine months, but it can. Uh, uh, occur later also, but that is the particular uh, age. 
uh, in which there is telescoping of the gut. One part of the, the, dis the distal gut goes into the proximal gut and there are chances of gangrene and necrosis and the child has severe pain. So immediate action has to be taken and it normally follows a, 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 an episode of diarrhea. So in a child, in an infant with crampy abdominal pain, you must palpate examination for an abdominal mass or and have intersusception uh, uh, in your differentials. So according on basis of these differentials, you will manage the patient. So in an approach to a child with diarrhea, you with the basic knowledge in in hand, you will make a you take a complete history. You do an examination, label the child with uh, uh, with what what level of dehydration the child has, and make a differential diagnosis. And now we'll come to the management part of it. To make it even simpler, the WHO has taken only four major points in the examination and based on that, that it has categorized into mild, moderate and severe dehydration. In severe dehydration, if there are two or more of the following signs are present and the signs are lethargy, unconsciousness, uh, number two, sunken eyes, number three, unable to drink or drinks poorly, and number four, the skin pinch goes back very slowly, more than two seconds, the child has severe dehydration and you have the treatment plan C for him, will be, which we'll be, uh, we'll be discussing. If the child has uh, some dehydration, the, then the following two signs will be present out of these four. The child will be restless and irritable. The child would have sunken eyes. He drinks eagerly and thirsty with thirst, uh, with thirst and the skin pinch goes back slowly. So for that, we can uh, we have a treatment plan B and uh, the child can have some period of observation in the in the hospital or in the clinic and then we can and he can return home with a treatment plan and with a follow-up is advised and if the chi child child does not classify into any of the above he has some or some dehydration or uh, uh, or uh, he doesn't have any somewhat severe dehydration, then he has no dehydration, but he has some symptoms. So you, that uh, child will be given uh, will uh, be given treatment plan A and uh, advised into increased fluid, ORS, food, and uh, the mother would be uh, uh, asked to return if she, the uh, if the child develop severe uh, symptoms or severe dehydration, and a follow up is advised. In treatment plan A for severe dehydration, according to the WHO, the total amount of fluid is 100 ml per kg, but it is divided. But uh, the duration is uh, dependent upon the age. If the age of a child of the patient is less than 12 months, so we divide the 100 ml 100 ml per kg into 30 ml and 70 ml. The third, first 30 ml will go in one hour and the rest 70 ml will go in five hours. So the total correction in in in, in a uh, infant less than one year of age would be in six hours. And then, then you will reassess. And after, if the child is more than 12 months, the, the 100 ml per kg of fluids will go in three hours. The, uh, the 30 ml per kg in 30 minutes and the rest 70 ml per kg in two and a half hours. And after that three hours, you will reassess. This is a little detailed uh, plan for a, a picture for the treatment plan C, a little bit in detail, but just remember the main points. As we have discussed, the, 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 since the in severe de dehydration, the baby is very sick and he is not able to uh, drink eagerly. So you'll refer him to an hospital get him IV fluid, that will be 100 ml per kg. If the child is less than one year, the, uh, the duration will be six hours. And if the child is uh, more than one year, the, the 100 ml per kg would, of fluids would go in and three hours. You will continue continuously reassess in between during these hours and you will offer them uh, ORS, advise them ORS, 5 ml per kg. And uh, uh, as soon as the child can drink, and uh, the, if there's continued loss, you can uh, you can uh, uh, tell them to replace the losses as well. The feeding, as soon as the child is able uh, to feed, you will ask the mother to give him, offer some food as well. 
and uh, if the, if you were not in uh, in a, a position to refer him to a hospital or you know in a you're in a very remote area uh, or IV access is not possible you can start with NG tube also nasogastric tube that is just for you to remember for now but nasogastric tube is an option and after six hours you will do a, a quick re uh, you will quickly reassess the child and reclassify whether he is in severe dehydration still severe dehydration because of the ongoing losses moderate dehydration or a better and then you devise the plan according treatment plan b is for a child with moderate dehydration so in that uh, in keeping that in mind the total amount of fluids is 75 mils per kg you can offer uh, him oral uh, oral rehydration from with ors if the child is able to drink and sometimes it happens so that you need to put an iv line also in in, in such particular cases and then and this 75 ml per kg of fluids would go in four hours you will reassess during the time the fluid is going during the process of rehydration and after four hours and then reassess whether the child has gone better or has gone worse because of the ongoing losses uh, and depending upon that you can again after four hours but whether he needs treatment a treatment plan a b or c this again is is the same thing a little bit in detail uh, the 75 mils per kg just don't remember this uh, amount of ml we get confused the 75 ml per kg of fluids has to go in four hours o ors is the is the is the fluid and you will show the mother how to make ORS, how to give ORS sip by sip, baby. And once he is better, he will put, he will uh, himself take a lot of uh, initiative in drinking. After you, you will uh, reassess while the child is being hydrated and at the end of four hours. And you will tell uh, the mother what treatment that the child is going to uh, get at home, the, how to make ORS again at home. You'll give him give her some packets. You'll tell her that the child will be needing extra fluid apart from the ORS as well. The ongoing to make up for the ongoing losses. You will give uh, zinc supplements, continue feeding, and tell her the signs of severe dehydration or or when to return immediately. And you can also ask her to follow up that the, the the episodes have not settled within after five days. These are the different type of the ORS available in the market. Some are flavored and some have some uh, rice based or other uh, uh, thickness at, uh, uh, added to them. There is a WHO uh, ORS and there is a low osmolar ORS as well. This is the composition of uh, ORS, sodium chloride. 2.6 grams per liter, trisodium citrate 2.9, potassium chloride 1.5, glucose anhydrase 13.5. ORS is the in, is the discovery of the century. It has saved lives. It's a very simple for, formula, but it works wonders. Now we come to the treatment plan A for no dehydration. The child has diarrhea, but he doesn't have any dehydration. So four basic points give extra fluid you'll tell the mother to give ORS as much as possible uh, to replace the ongoing losses and to <clears throat> make sure that the child does not land up into dehydration you have to teach the mother how to make ORS some uh, packets come in for two glasses some come for one four glasses what is the liter because they, these most of the mothers come from very rural areas and the exact uh, and to make the exact ORS is of prime importance. You will number two. You will give mother <clears throat> zinc supplements and tell them to use it for complete 10 to 14 days. You will tell the mother to continue feeding. In some families, because of the diarrhea, they will not give feed. They will stop feeding the child. <clears throat> you must tell them the child needs extra calories and continue feeding. And must explain at the end the signs of severe dehydration of the child continues to have symptoms to tell them to return and follow up. Apart from ORS, zinc is 
is a must in a child of uh, for a child with diarrhea you will advise mother the child is uh, uh, up to 6 months 10 mg per day more than 6 months 20 mg per day for complete 10 to 14 days for uh, recovery from diarrhea and not to go into uh, malnutrition because of the uh, damage done to the uh, gastric uh, epithelium this chart for the antimicrobial agents in the treatment of specific causes has been taken from who and according to the who these medicines are giving all though we know there are a couple of other uh, antibiotics for the same uh, infections as well for example in cholera uh, we have doxycycline and other uh, antibiotics as well apart from trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole in shigella and campylobacter again we have other choice choices of antibiotics as well apart from these MEBSs and GRGRDSs have to be treated with metronidazole but having said that most of the diarrheas are viral and you will treat and you will not advise antibiotic unless you see a case of dysentery or you are thinking of cholera so according to the WHO you will only give them ORS zinc advise them probiotics and a continue feeding antibiotics are only reserved in for specific cases and like as uh, I have already said uh, do not give any other drugs your focus should be only on rehydration and zinc supplementation and probiotics and feeding these lopramide low motels antimetics are of no use and they have a lot of side effects as well so your focus should be only on mostly rehydration and prevention uh, of malnutrition okay students what is dysentery dysentery is is uh, diarrhea with uh, containing blood in it and uh, the most of the episodes are due to shigella the child mostly has is sick has crampy abdominal pain and this is one scenario where antibiotic is recommended these are the signs uh, in dysentery the child has uh, blood in stools, fever, abdominal pain, may after uh, prolonged uh, diarrhea, may they, they might have sepsis and electrolyte imbalances uh, leading to convergence, lethargy, dehydration uh, again would be moderate and severe and prolonged will, uh, can also cause rectal prolapse. Treatment of dysentery, antibiotics, I have already, uh, I have already said there are uh, are an important part of the treatment apart from the, the uh, antibiotic we already know the dehydration has to be uh, managed uh, along with zinc the, the zinc supplements are also advised with antibiotics for 10 to 14 days like any other diarrhea for us the most important part of diarrhea and most important part of managing a good society or community would be prevention of diarrhea we know that diarrhea causes 1.5 billion cases every year most of 80 uh, percent of children are less than five years and a lot of children die and even if they are safe they land up into malnutrition um, so we, the prevention could be at primary prevention secondary prevention and tertiary prevention at primary pre prevention you would pre prevent a child from having any diarrhea which could be done uh, by establishing mother feed initially avoiding bottle feed safe uh, feeding practices and safe uh, drinking water improve personal and domestic hygiene hand washing and then uh, uh, secondary prevention prevention could be early by early picking up a child with diarrhea and dehydration uh, managing uh, managing the child well uh, according to the treatment plan a b c after uh, uh, classifying them and continuing feed and continuing uh, mother feed and weaning diet to save them from concurrent malnutrition and if you see any deficiencies of micronutrients you uh, advise folate zinc and other nutrients to cater for immediately and number three 
is again prevents uh, tertiary prevention uh, ter uh, tertiary prevention is would be from saving them from malnutrition and for the complications of diarrhea by by uh, continuously monitoring them and guiding the mother and asking her to follow up the most important development is the develop uh, is the uh, development of the vaccination measles a uh, notorious infection uh, can cause diarrhea and the child lands up into malnutrition measles vaccination is present uh, is available you must counsel parents uh, and families around you to get them properly vaccinated rota virus vaccination is available and has reduced the episodes of uh, diarrhea and the bulk of patients dramatically so we must encourage prevention prevention at all levels thank you and we'll uh, discuss these things and we'll carry it forward once you come to clinics in uh, in pediatric departments okay all the best assalam alaikum